So we're very lucky this Friday to have Piers Kelly with us, uh, providing the latest in our Friday seminar series. So Piers, um, I know him from ANU days where Piers did his PhD with Nick Evans and Alan Rumsey. He did that on a uh, esoteric and apparently utopian writing system slash invented language called Eskayan from a uh, Southern Filipino island. Um, and he's, now, he's since then gone on to study various kinds of orthographic systems and more broadly kind of graphic codes. And this research that he does really, I love the way it combines both very anthropological human sides of language and what people think that language can do for them and very like technical analysis and you know uh, quite rigorous formal analysis. Um, now since the ANU days, uh, Pierce then went on to do, I remember he was doing media stuff for Curdle at one stage where he was incredibly valuable helping us translate our weird ideas into things that normal people might be interested in. But then he went over to Germany where he was at the Max Planck, uh, the MPI in Jena. And what else since then? All right. And then, of course, back to University of New England in Armadale, where he's now a senior lecturer. And as many of you would have heard, woo, was recently awarded a DECRA, where he will be researching Australian Indigenous message sticks, uh, collaborating with, I think, some Indigenous historians as well at University of New England. And so I guess we're getting a bit of an entree today into that research. So please, Pierce, take it away. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks for that lovely introduction. Thanks everyone for having me and greetings from Anawan lands in New South Wales. So there is a minor content warning, which you can see in um, there in the, the first five minutes of the, the presentation, because I want to start by talking about two um, disconnected historical incidents. The first took place in February of 1869, when authorities in Gainda, Queensland, arrested a 19-year-old Aboriginal man on suspicion of rape. In the newspaper reports, that man is referred to simply as Jacob, and we can assume that he was a traditional owner of the Wagga Wagga country on which Gainda is situated because he carried hunting weapons on that land. He was sent east to Maryborough, where he was tried, convicted, and sentenced by a circuit judge. On the 16th of April, he was escorted to Brisbane jail to await execution by hanging. While in prison there, some of his kinsmen who had followed him to Brisbane smuggled a message into his cell. When Jacob's jailers discovered the message in his possession, the prison authorities conducted in an investigation into an alleged escape plot. And here is a sketch of the material evidence that was brought to that inquiry. This is, of course, a message stick. And since it's cylindrical, we're viewing it from four different angles in this sketch. Unfortunately, the details of the inquiry have reached us third hand and they're very limited. We know that a native trooper by the name of Charbig, and who was not actually from Waka Waka country, was asked to provide expert evidence. And Charbig read this object as follows. Um, two black fellows come up in two days, 17 days ago. One black fellow come up to where this fellow Jacob sit down. The track shown on the stick means that from the place where the black fellow set out to Brisbane. The message means that the Aboriginals were taking steps to aid Jacob in some attempt at escape. There are a lot of questions here about the validity of this evidence and its interpretation. This may not have been for coordinating an escape at all. It may have simply been a successful attempt to establish communication. In any case, Jacob was executed in Brisbane jail on the 17th of May, 1869. But this is the very first time that a message stick enters into the colonial record. And it's really remarkable to me that the prison authorities were willing to assume that this object could be read as a document with some kind of legal validity. The object itself is missing. It was last noted in an 1878 uh, catalogue for the National Gallery of Victoria. So I'm hoping that it's currently in a museum's Victoria storage, but mislabeled. And I'm in the middle of um, discussions with staff there. I don't want to pile speculation on top of speculation, but if we wanted to try to gloss this object, we can, for example, identify 17 marks um, here, 
which may correspond to a, a tally of 17 days in Chabig's interpretation. The two black feathers are perhaps here on the left. Um, this is potentially the track indicating the journey of the two men and the single notch is possibly um, Jacob himself. Retrospectively, if we look at later examples of well-glossed message sticks, this would be a reasonable interpretation. On to the second historical incident, and we're going to fast forward 63 years to the Caledon Bay crisis of the early 1930s. Um, there's Caledon Bay in north, northeast Arnhem Land. This was um, a complicated affair in which Yongle men speared and killed five Japanese fishermen on Yongle country, and also a white police officer who later came to investigate. Uh, a Northern Territory administrator proposed a punitive expedition, in other words, a massacre against the Yongle, which was thankfully quashed by the Interior Minister. But tensions were running high, uh, especially after two missing white fishermen were later reported to have been killed by Yongle on Wuda Island. So at a certain point, the Commonwealth arranged a diplomatic mission to try to open a dialogue and, and broker a truce, if you like, and they sent the anthropologist Donald Thompson to meet with uh, Wongo Monongo, a Yongo elder and father of some of those men accused of the killings. Now, Thompson had earlier visited a few of Wongo's sons <clears throat> who were then in Fanny Bay Jail in Darwin, and these men uh, made a message stick for Thompson to carry to Wongo, ensuring Thompson's safe passage into Yongo country. Here is the item in question now conserved at the um, Bukulanga Mulka Center in Yagala. So eventually the two men met and after their discussions, Wongu in turn gave Thompson a reply message stick to send back to Darwin. There's the reply message stick. Thompson recalls, later he brought me a message stick and explained that the marks inscribed upon it represented himself sitting down quietly and maintaining peace among the people. Um, this is a sketch of the message stick and the little cross here that I've highlighted represents Mongu, that's his mark, uh, sitting down leaving a curved mark on the ground. And then there are these uh, radiating lines, perhaps representing the relationships that Mongu is at the center of. This object became evidence that the two representatives had agreed on a peace deal and it was also evidence that his sons could accept. And I'm relying for all of this account on a great chapter by uh, Mindy Allen, and also Donald Thompson's own book compiled by Nick Peterson. These are just two events, um, but I'm going to suggest that they're both connected in a unified but diverse tradition of message stick communication that once encompassed almost all of the Australian continent. And there are many more stories like these two that I could relate. My um, ARC DECRA project starting next year is addressing the big question of um, what role did message sticks play in Indigenous long distance communication? So ambitiously, I'm interested in the entire history and practice from pre-contact to the present, but today with a captive audience of linguists and other specialists, I'm gonna to try to narrow the focus to two sub questions, which are what are message sticks exactly? And how is it that they perform their communicative work? Um, so <clears throat> uh, in other words, what does a message stick add to an interaction that couldn't be done without it? And as we'll see, this is essentially about pragmatics. And more generally, how can a linguistic or a linguistic anthropological framework or any framework help us with these questions? Um, this project hasn't officially begun, so I'm afraid that you won't be getting, what you won't be getting today is a whole lot of results. This is all very exploratory um, at this stage. So I'll just, I'll start off with my working definition of a message stick, just to give you something to grasp onto. I define a message stick as a marked wooden object used in Indigenous Australia for facilitating public communications between groups or individuals. And I might come back to different elements of this definition as I go. Um, <clears throat> there's already a small body of research on message sticks, and this is because from the 1880s, settlers as well as visitors to Australia became very interested in them, and they really wanted to understand what they were and how they worked. In fact, the famous German anthropologist Adolf Bastian was in Cooktown in 1880 and literally packing up his stuff to go home when he learned about message sticks from two native troopers, one of whom even made one for him. Um, and Bastian was so excited um, and did as much documentation as he could and he nearly missed his steamer. Now, most of Bastian's anthropological colleagues 
adhered to the social evolutionist paradigm in which societies were seen to progress in unilinear fashion from hunter-gatherers to agriculturalists to agriculturalists to civilized state societies of which the crowning technological achievement was seen to be writing. Once the society acquires writing, according to this model, it literally enters into history, into record making. Aboriginal Australians by near um, consensus among the learned were considered to be at the lowest rung of this stadial arrangement. So Bastian later ended up giving a paper for the Berlin Anthropological Society in which he first summarized the core tenets of social evolutionism and then challenged them on the basis of his new but very shortly glimpsed understanding of message sticks. He said, there he is there. <clears throat> he said, if therefore a substitute for writing can be identified among these Australians, then it is easy to see that everything comes to a head since either an entire division is to be turned upside down so that the lowest comes to the highest or both divisions intersect one another again across the borderlines. And such a radical revolution of the entire system could then be brought about by a single small collection piece. So the mere possibility that a message stick was informative enough to be a kind of alternative to writing challenged the very foundations of this, this origin myth of racial and cultural superiority, which we're still contending with today under new guises. After this, other visiting anthropologists like uh, Rudolf Virchow and Emil Huse took on Bastian's enthusiasm for message sticks and tried to encourage a new research program. Unfortunately, this is where a real opportunity was missed because when settler scholars took up the baton, they constructed a kind of false debate where they said, well, you know, some fools suppose that message sticks are a kind of indigenous writing and we can prove that they are not. Uh, and that was a pity um, because it promoted a kind of tunnel vision where message sticks were only measured in relation to writing rather than on their own terms. However, there was in the 1880s uh, and, and a bit beyond some, some serious attempts to understand how the system works and where, where in Australia it was used. So E.M. Kerr sent out his famous pan-continental um, survey to elicit ethnographic data um, and vocabulary from indigenous communities and he included the question, uh, it has been said that messages are sent from one tribe to another by figures painted on bark or cut on sticks. Will you give me your experience on the subject? Um, later on, A.W. Howard in about 1888 sent out his own survey with more detailed questions on this topic, really trying to get down to the, to the nitty gritty. Um, here's a copy of um, Howard's survey. Um, and uh, he, this is what he ended up um, concluding about the system from synthesizing various responses from all over Australia. So firstly, a man might decide to send a message to another camp in a neighboring locale. And to do this, he would first appoint a messenger of the same kin category as the intended recipient before carving a message in his presence. After the sender had explained its contents, his messenger would carry the stick overland, displaying it prominently um, in order to signal his privileged role as messenger. Upon arriving at his destination, the messenger delivered the stick to the recipient and produced an oral recapitulation of its message while referring to the marks. Messengers might also bring additional emblematic tokens as props, depending on the content of the message. Thus, a message concerning male initiation uh, could be accompanied by a, a bull roarer, or if it was about war, um, the messenger might bring a shield. Howard ascribed three functions to message six. The first was to identify a messenger, um, um, uh, you know, to identify the messenger as having the right to cross into neighboring country without having to negotiate permission. Um, and you'll recall Donald Thompson here. Uh, the second was to lend authority to an oral message that he delivered, like a signature or, or a royal seal. And you'll recall Wongu's special mark. Um, and the third was to help the messenger recall the details of an oral message by means of a visual prompt, like a knot in a handkerchief, if you like. And in some cases, only the first two functions needed to be activated as a vouchsafe for an already well-memorized verbal statement. And this is where Howard took pains to point out that message sticks were not a form of language-based writing since the motifs could never be interpreted without assistance from the sender or his messenger. 
In his estimation, the motifs themselves were entirely arbitrary. Nonetheless, he provided sketched illustrations of 12 message sticks uh, and gave the glosses for a number of motifs as reported by the senders or messengers. And we as readers can imagine that if these um, um, motifs had consistent conventional meanings with wider currency, it would leave open the, the possibility that they were more than the mere personal mnemonic marks of the sender. In other words, how its documentation left room for an implicit fourth function of message sticks, which was to encode um, conventionalized information in graphic form to be interpreted later by a recipient. There are a few problems with how it's data and synthesis right off the bat. First, he was not a terrible anthropologist, but like Ian e. Kerr, he elicited all this information indirectly and at a distance from uh, white station owners, police officers, missionaries, and so on. And he used very leading questions. Secondly, he generalized the system and underplayed variation. So whether it's far North Queensland or the Nullarbor Plain, the system is imagined and reified as, as universal. Eight years later, though, we finally get some direct in situ field work based on consultation with Indigenous specialists. And this was published by Walter Roth, who consulted messengers at Bullia in Queensland. Roth did not actively contradict Howard, but it's clear from his documentation of the message sticks in this part of Australia that the motifs are conventionalised. Um, so there's some of his glossing. In other words, they have <coughs> consistent meanings all on their own. There's no more published fieldwork on message sticks in this period, and the consensus position amongst settler scholars remains pretty much un unchanged. So here are the key points in summary that participants, uh, so a message communication involves a triadic interaction between a sender messenger and a recipient. Participants are male, the messenger and recipient belong to the same social category. So be that section, subsection, totem, whatever. Um, the message is conveyed orally from sender to messenger, then from messenger to recipient. Uh, and it's about a finite range of topics, which limits the interpretive possibilities. The object itself has a credentialing function, like a royal seal or a passport. It's inscribed with motifs that correspond to elements of the oral message. Um, the motifs are idiosyncratic, um, though some have conventionalized meanings and some are purely decorative. As I mentioned earlier in public discourse, there's a lot of people who want to go out of their way to throw cold water on Bastian's position and emphasize that not only are message sticks not anything like writing, they're basically no more than symbolic tokens or mnemonic devices, and there's just not a lot more to say about them. In fact, in 1895, a message stick was on display in the Queensland Museum with a small explanatory placard that simply read meaningless. Um, some, including Howard, hasten to add that, you know, message sticks are on their way to becoming writing. They're on this evolutionary path. They're basically a form of proto-writing. I suspect that this general prejudice contributed to the shoddiness of the documentation and collection practices from the 1890s onwards. Most often in museum registers, you get a single entry message stick and a very general site collection. What's interesting is that visiting European anthropologists didn't take on these assumptions, at least not to the same extent. So this is why German ethnography in particular can be fantastic. I mean, have a look at the relative level of detail in this entry. It's very hard to read. And I've had to get a lot of help from someone who's naturally talented at historical handwriting to annotate this, but it's a lot richer. This is um, collected by Carl Saal, I think, up in, uh, up in Robe and in Northwest uh, Australia in the Pilbara. In any case, we are left with um, this set of precepts about message sticks, but there's a few signs from the early 20th century that this isn't really the whole story. Um, the most remarkable being the regular reports of message sticks that were um, inscribed and sent and correctly interpreted without any oral gloss provided by a messenger. And this was arguably the case with the message stick from Brisbane Jail that I mentioned before, but there's at least 14 similar documented examples, including cases where the messenger died, but the object was recovered and correctly interpreted. And Indigenous people were also sending message sticks through the regular mail as well, which is interesting. Um, but I'm going to talk about just two cases that are interesting to me because they were tested under semi-experimental conditions. Um, in August of 1901, the Anglican Bishop Gilbert White, um, Bishop of Carpentaria, boarded a coach 
from Port Darwin, bound for Daily Waters Telegraph Station. So that's the route there overland. Uh, and before they departed, an Aboriginal boy approached the driver and asked if he could deliver a message stick for him to an individual at Daily Waters. Um, and Gilbert White overheard this exchange and offered to take on the role of messenger. Uh, and he was then entrusted with this, this object I'm showing here uh, and with the following verbal message, one and pretty fella long ahead, boomerang. Okay, so this is a request for headbands and boomerangs. Now, when White got to Daily Waters and found the intended recipient, he handed over this object, but withheld the message as a test. And sure enough, the recipient interpreted the message stick correctly. Uh, then in the 1910s, uh, Indigenous people at Karani, outside of Kalgoorlie, required the presence of two men camped at Uldia, so all the way over in South Australia. So rather than walking 600 miles, uh, the message stick was entrusted to a white passenger on the weekly grocery train who was given quite a complicated message and he too withheld this message on purpose when he arrived at Uldia and was surprised to discover that the recipient gave correct interpretation. And this is the documented message. Take along a windbring, they been Wanam, Lame Charlie and Big Peter. All Garani Noonga go back big robbery, meaning all the Karani mob are having ceremony and we need these two men. And one more just tangential anecdote, the, the scholar W.A. McElroy was so inspired by Spencer and Gillen's account of message sticks that in uh, 1952, he joined Elkin's expedition to the Northern Territory and decided to test Aboriginal people in Arnhem Land for ESP powers. Um, and he concluded that, that they had them. Um, there's the paper there. I won't dwell on that, um, but in any case, there's clearly more to understand and we need much better data. So. Coming back to my questions, what are message sticks? Uh, how do they work? I want to um, talk about how I hope to address the data problem and how I want to push the entrenched colonial perspectives to one side and try to recenter the expertise of Indigenous specialists. So Howard and Kerr's surveys are fairly thin and they're going to take us only so far. We've also got this problem with the sparse museum records. But as it turns out, there are really quite a lot of message sticks sitting in museums around the world, most with terrible documentation, some with very good documentation. And there are elderly Indigenous cultural authorities who can talk about their experiences of message sticks within their own lifetimes or who have um, inherited oral stories and knowledge about them. So um, I've spent a few years now compiling the Australian message stick database. Um, this is based at the Max Planck in Jena, Germany. Um, the data entry interface is in Canberra and I'm using Junran Lay's Occam's module for this. The scope of the data set is defined in this way. If a message stick exists or has ever been known to exist, it will get its own entry in the database. Um, at the moment there are 1,154 entries, about 864 of those come from my visits to museums around the world. So these are objects that exist somewhere. Uh, another 156 entries are from records only. So a message stick is mentioned in a letter or an explorer diary, or maybe there's a photo of it or a rubbing or a sketch. Um, the remainder are from private collections or private sales. And for each entry, I plug in as much information as I can across a bunch of fields. I won't go through more, the more the important ones being who are the makers, um, the traditional country of origin, the traditional country of destination, the oral message and the relationship between the oral message and the motifs. So where that information is available, it gets plugged in. I've also set it up in such a way that descriptions that come directly from Indigenous people are given analytic primacy. And there are levels of coding here. So anything that is unsupported speculation is relegated to a notes field. But if the knowledge is from country in situ, from an Indigenous knowledge holder, this is represented as such. And you can filter them in this way. Um, I'm inspired by Angie Abdullah's concept of country-centred design uh, for digital archives. In a few cases, it's been really wonderful to connect paper records with otherwise somewhat orphaned objects into a single database entry and reconstruct that previously disconnected knowledge to return to traditional owners. I'm doing a small project with Dr. Lorena Barker at UNE. She's a, um, a Murawari woman 
uh, oral historian and there's an object in the Australian Museum listed as maker unknown. It's actually on display right now uh, as maker unknown, but we've we've been able to trace it quite confidently to uh, two named Murawari individuals and to recover something of the meaning and the context of this artifact and even a bit of the oral history. And that's, that's ongoing at the moment. Uh, a tiny amount of the data in the database is suppressed by request of museums. None of it is suppressed by traditional owners and this is what makes these collaborations possible. These are all public objects. Um, there is unfortunately terminological confusion, particularly in Western Australia, thanks to sloppiness on the part of the Burnts and Daisy Bates. The term message stick is sometimes erroneously applied to objects that are not message sticks and are in fact sacred. These are not in the database. And in my definition, which is supported by Indigenous consultants and lexical evidence, message sticks are public. They kind of have to be because they need to signal permission from a distance. So when a message stick is listed somewhere is restricted, either the description is wrong or it's not a message stick. And either way, we, we just leave it out. Um, all of the database is um, exportable as a text file and it allows you to do you know, cool stuff. If you focus just on traditional message sticks and the dates and places that they were first collected, you can produce a map that looks uh, like this showing the shrinking ecology of traditional message sticks over the 20th century. But it has also pointed me to the parts of Australia where traditional message stick communications are recalled in living memory. And to some extent, the practice continues in these locations in new ways. Um, so pre-pandemic, I did some pilot research up in the Tiwi Islands and Western Arnhem Land with enormous thanks to Codal and uh, to the uh, art centres up there. In the Tiwi Islands, I collected the beginnings of a few oral histories, but in Manningreed and Outstations, message sticks were, they were still being sent as recently as the 1970s. And so I was um, privileged to meet the, the uh, late senior knowledge holder, skin named Gamarang, husband of Lena Yarankura, who demonstrated the entire process from the harvesting of the materials through to the inscription, the sending of the message and so on. I'm still very slowly working my way through hours of recordings of him and Lena, and I um, can't show you any images, I'm afraid, for obvious reasons. Um, I've, uh, I had a few meetings with the author, Stanley Rankin, uh, a, who is revitalizing the tradition, or if you like, continuing it. Uh, there he's there. He's made a message stick, um, inviting a boy to a japi ceremony. Um, he also made a, a he's, we, he glossed it for me there too, it's some annotations. He has, um, he also made a message stick with Jack Nawalil and sent it to the NT Education Department in 2015 with a demand to uh, honour an agreement about teachers' accommodation. That's the one there in Man and Greta. Really terrific stuff. And I'm hoping to bring Stanley to Melbourne if he's willing. Uh, in any case, I plan to go back to work with Jack Nawalil and others and do the luxury Jenny Green style multimodal documentation per this wonderful book. So I, I won't do as good a job as Jenny, but you know, to capture language, manufacture, motifs, explication, audio visually recorded from more than one camera and annotate, annotated as individual tiers in Elan. This is sort of the maximum descriptive adequacy, I think. Um, me and Salome Harris also hope to work in Eastern Arnhem Land on or in the vicinity of Wagilat country. And those plans with Salome are in the early stages, so I won't go into that. All of this preliminary data in both the database and the top end pilot field work um, is already showing a few things. So <clears throat> returning to this slide with a kind of settler scholar consensus position, I have some hunches of what's going to be found. So uh, message to communication involves triadic interaction. Yes, that looks pretty good. Um, almost everywhere in Australia, the message stick system does seem to be triadic. Um, but over the colonial period, we increasingly get a dyadic routine in some places where the person composing the message and making the stick is also the person then carrying it to the recipient. Participants are male, uh, mostly, but not always in some interesting cases. Again, this is something that I, uh, I believe is changing over the colonial period. Um, messenger and recipient belong to the same social category. 
Okay, yes, but um, this I think has more to do with diplomacy. So a messenger will be someone that has already some rights to be protected on foreign country and social category and kin relations determine this. And this is the person that might also be permitted to talk about the topic of the message. So that needs to be complexified a little bit. Uh, message is conveyed orally from sender to messenger, la la. Yes, uh, but we get these instances of asynchronous communication without orality um, to back it up, and that demands explanation. It can be about a what are we up to? It can be about a finite range of topics. Um, yes, I think this is this is true. I'll get to that. Has a credentialing function. Yes, everywhere I've seen it does. Um, and the object is inscribed with motifs that correspond to elements of the oral message. Hmm, not so much. There are just so many cases where the oral message and the inscribed message are not isomorphic. They complement each other, but they contain different kinds of information or they signal different things. Um, the motifs are idiosyncratic inventions of the sender, designed as personal mnemonic aids, some are decorative. Look, I think this last point is doomed. Uh, motifs are often multivalent, uh, so they have one motif to many meanings. Some are indeed decorative, um, but they are not entirely idiosyncratic. I think I'm going to find more and more regional conventions. And also when you look at um, reports from Indigenous people themselves, nobody is ever claiming these are mnemonic devices. This is a, a settler assumption. The longest recorded message is about six lines long. It's a Gamilaroi message stick. But usually it's about one sentence long. And this is not a huge memory load, especially when you consider the capacity of some of these men and women to you know, remember ceremonial songs that go all day long. So finally, I just want to kind of sketch out how I'm starting to think about a way forward. And this is where I look forward to your help. Um, so I'm now thinking about message sticks in terms of three core ideas. They're illocutionary force, to steal a term. In other words, what are they doing socially? What intention are they signalling? What are they mandating in a given interaction? Their informativeness, in other words, how are inferences constrained? What are the graphic and semantic conventions, if any? And what determines or defines communicative success and failure in terms of the system as a whole? And finally, how are they similar and how do they vary across cultural space and across historical time? The first two ideas here are interrelated in my view. When we recall that settler scholars wanted to separate out their social credentialing functions from their perceived um, mnemonic functions and then their relationship to the spoken message, I think it's much more useful to think of all of this in terms of a a more holistic dynamic of mutual reinforcement or reciprocal reinforcement across modalities. The verbal message is not a translation of the message stick, it's a reinforcement of it, but not a translation. And the message stick is not a kind of transcript of the verbal message, rather they are all reinforcing one another. So I'm gonna try and explain this a little bit further by quickly discussing uh, canonical topics and how I think inferences are constrained. So in terms of topics, what I've noticed from the data so far is that message stick communications are always about coordinating or mandating uh, the movements of people and resources, reporting on the movements of people and resources, or establishing political relations, which in turn usually entails movements of people and resources. Most um, message sticks in the database are in fact announcements for the beginning of ceremony, so initiation, funerals, and so on. And this is confirmed by my opinion, Gunmok consultants in Western Arnhem Land as the major use in that area. So that's why I think of them as being declarative and I think they contribute to the mandating of ceremony and the call to assembly of relevant people at one time in one place. If you think of that Karen one that ended up at Aldia Soak on the train, that's an instance of that. So it's less of an invitation, more of a summons. Uh, some are about coordinating hunting teams. There are also many that are requests or negotiations for specific resources. There are a lot of, you know, shopping lists, please bring tobacco, calico, etc. They might also be for military resources or marriage arrangements. So this is where the political dimension overlaps with movements of people and resources. And the way in which um, message sticks are used today in contemporary settings are is really a continuation of this third topic, if you think of that one that went to the Department of Ed Education. Uh, and most often it's uh, about formalising a dialogue or a demand between an Indigenous institution and a non-Indigenous institution. Every 
single Prime Minister since Menzies has been given a message stick. Um, Prince Charles and the Queen have been given message sticks. So that's the, the, the diplomatic channel confirming function there. Um, so <clears throat> now that we understand something about mutually reinforcing modes and the fact that there are predetermined topics of communication, it's, I think, easier to see how inferences might be constrained. But looking at the, the entire interaction, there are other things that are constraining inference. Um, messengers some, sometimes carry props or emblematic tokens, is how it called them, and they might wear body paint that had fixed meanings. Even more importantly, when you're, <clears throat> excuse me, thinking of the relationship between the, the sender and the recipient, um, we have communicative expectations that are set up by their kinship relationship. So what the norms of interaction will be <clears throat> and what the appropriate topics are. And then quite simply, the contextual common ground between these participants, their shared history, or what each knows the other already knows. So if you saw a messenger approaching from a distance, you might see that they're covered in, say, white ochre, and thus you might already know that they're announcing the death of an individual and the beginning of mortuary rites. As they get closer, you might recognise them as a particular kinsperson, so you would have then a good idea about who died. And this is before you even examine the message stick or listen to the verbal message or worry about what any of the motifs refer to. Um, so I've got a, this is my early diagram about how to make sense of what's going on with constrained in inference, the context and then the oral message and the motifs, which are some have overlapping concerns, but are not the same thing. The motifs themselves are somewhat finite. They may represent um, named individuals, like Wonku's signature, groups of people, objects or landscapes, um, uh, landmarks, and numbers, including units of time, days, months, and so on. Don't look too closely at this either. It's very much at me, my figuring out of various artifacts, trying to, uh, you know, note down glosses of different motifs. Um, so if a message stick reaches you without a messenger, you might still know who sent it, and thus the common ground or shared context between you, what the range of relevant topics are, and then you can identify the meanings of individual motifs. So this is how I understand what makes successful asynchronous communication possible. That is, um, that is, you know, communicate the, the message to communication without verbal support. Uh, so the motifs are often multivalent. One sign has many meanings. And in some cases, there is even a defined reading order or orientation. But relations between motifs can also be diagrammatic. Um, so this happens when you have representations of landscape and people moving within landscapes. Are uh, message sticks writing? Uh, no, not when you define writing as I do, which is as a visual or material representation of linguistic structure such that a message can be reconstructed in a specific language. But I think this is also the wrong question. One thing that settlers never paid much attention to is that message sticks were frequently crossing linguistic borders. So the messenger was receiving his instructions in one language and then reproducing the oral message in another language at the other side of a border. Language is, of course, not a barrier in multilingual Indigenous Australia, but this reality helps us appreciate that the motifs are not representing linguistic structure in A or any language. That would not even be uh, useful. There's a couple of examples where we get partial linguistic structure, maybe. I don't know exactly what to make of this Wagamai one on the top there on the slide um, from Herbert River, <laughs> sent from a man called Garalinga to his wife, Noanjong. The documenter, Carl Lumholtz, is not particularly reliable, but we seem to at least be getting some kind of linear clause structure in this sketch, at least. And there's a single rebus in a message stick from Victoria showing a hand sign. It's hard to see there. It's what I've circled in red. Um, representing the word mara or hand in the Warrnambool language, but it's also a homophone of the word mara for meeting, which is the intended meeting, the meaning on this object. That fully satisfies the definition of writing because the linguistic structure that's being represented here is sound, it's phonographic. Uh, but I emphasize this is a one-off example. 
out of 1,000 plus message sticks, but very intriguing nonetheless. You also see that that looks very much like a spear thrower. That's because it is, this is a repurposed object repurposed as a message stick. Okay, and sadly, this item uh, was destroyed in a fire in the 1960s. However, functionally, in terms of what message sticks actually achieve, they're doing the work of writing in a lot of cases. And Indigenous people, past and present, will happily point out those functional correspondences. In Arnhem Land, message sticks are called letter sticks in Aboriginal English, and settlers too called them blackfellow letters. And in the case of the Brisbane jail, inquiry, they treated them as if they were writing. Over time, Aboriginal people even began to incorporate alphabetic letters or representations of writing into message stick designs like uh, this amazing object from the Kimberley. You'll recall, um, and also things like cattle brands and um, playing card suits and things like that, uh, police insignias too. You'll recall Bastian referring to the system as shrift substitute or uh, an alternative to writing. In reality, I think they're doing both more than writing in terms of mutually reinforcing different modes while communicating across linguistic boundaries and less than writing in that they are detached from the phonological or morphological structure of a spoken language. So that's all from me. I'm right at the beginning. I'm really excited about the overall project. If anyone wants to engage with these topics or consider research in this area or consider how your existing research might overlap with this area. I have a kind of a starter kit of readings I can send. I'm also trying to encourage postgraduate students to consider research topics. There is a lot to work on here. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Piers, for a fantastic presentation. Now I will just unshare your screen again. Okay so we can see each other's beautiful faces. Oh, hang on, we have to put our videos on for that. Oh. So no doubt there will be questions. We've got 15 minutes, so we've got a bit of time for questions and discussion. Would anyone, let's try and do the hand raising function if you can, but while people are thinking about that, if anyone wants to just jump in, please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Piers, you dropped a slide in there and then left it very quickly where you talked about ESP. Oh. <laughs> um, Sorry. I'm not showing you that one again. Okay. <laughs> oh. I was just wondering if you, if, you know, if there was anything that, that had caught the imagination, like, like, you know, like ESP and that these message sticks then, you know, carried vibrations or something, I don't know. Um, is there anything like that, that that's written about as well? Um, I mean, this is, the only example and even in that thing I, you can't see my screen share anymore and I went or can you, can you see me yeah. no um yeah look that article is not particularly um it only it evokes message sticks at the beginning as kind of the motivation this is why we it but it, it the rest of the paper McElroy doesn't talk about message sticks again so he does these weird experiments with like um gramophone records sounds and like all this wonderful weird stuff um and then he has a bunch of numbers which apparently prove that aboriginal people are the magic black fella trope is you know confirmed or whatever but i've not come across any of that i love though all this kind of cultural history stuff as well so i'm hoping to find more of these things looking at that the strange ideas that settlers had about message six is certainly very interesting they come into fiction into kind of pulp novels as well across the 20th century um, and one of the student projects that I've set up is actually you know could you look at the weird stuff that white people you know and, and ethnography of white people's uh, attitudes to message sticks at, over time so if you do find anything cool like that please send it to me thanks uh, Jenny please hi no thanks Yes, it's fantastic. It's so I had no idea that the there was so much rich data and so on. I just had looking at the examples. I had a question about symmetry, and yeah. I suppose when I think of sand drawings, you know, the thing about the sand drawing is it's got it's sort of anchored meaningfully in space, so you can view it from any direction. Yeah. So do these objects have a sort of like when you deliver it, you have to 
point the rough edge north or something? Do they have a sort of, is there any uh, evidence of them being a correct spatial reading which might yeah. add I've, to the I've meaning of this question. perhaps? Yeah, and um, I did speak to Ayu Lee about this as well uh, with her. And she she um, was looking at her research um, in terms of, she was reading some interesting stuff from uh, about graphic novels and spatial, you know, all that sort of theory. Um, yes, there are a few indications that there is a, a, a way that in some cases, certainly with the bullia message sticks from Roth, that you're supposed to, oh, I wish I brought one with me, I could show you. Got one. Anyway, so we'll pretend this is a message stick and you are, it is supposed to be um, read, read or interpreted from the bottom up. Um, so, so it's kind of read in a vertical way. <clears throat> um, and in my database, I'm really bad because I put, I orient them all this way, regardless um, just because, which is a classic, like, uh, <clears throat> this is writing, therefore it needs to be read in this way. This is really just to make it easier to kind of make a consistent transcription of the motifs. But this is something I really want to understand more. Um, symmetry, and unlike, uh, I mean, the one I'm looking at on my screen now um, from um, Northern Territory Education Department is very symmetrical, but often it's the lack of symmetry which tells you that it's a message stick, especially when you're trying to differentiate it for um, these uh, things that are mislabeled as message sticks, but are, which are really during us from Central Australia or from Western Australia, which do tend to be um, uh, quite symmetrical. Unfortunately, I've seen too many of those by mistake. Um, but they're quite symmetrical and that's a, a way of being able to tell the difference, um, I think, often. Jeff, you have a question? Yeah, um, I, sorry, I can't get my video going. The host has disabled my video. Hi, Jeff. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I hope I'm not that ugly. No, <laughs> right, I, uh, yeah. Oh, there we go, good. Hi, Jeff. Hey, how you going? Hey, thanks, Pierce, for a great talk. Really, really interesting. Um, just one picky observation. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if your definition of, of writing is too narrow, if you consider pictographic systems like Chinese, etc. Okay, um, Look, yeah, I love that you asked that question because it's something I do agonize over a lot. And um, my, there, there are two schools of thought about this. There are people who want to go for the broad definition and people want to go for a narrow definition. Um, Chinese suits my definition, by the way, because um, Chinese writing system is very much representing linguistic structure. There's a little bit of a kind of a folklore that Chinese system is ideographic. It's actually not that much ideographic. It's mostly phonographic. Um, it's mostly representing syllables. Anyway, that aside, the broad, the, those in favour of the broad definition of writing will basically want to include any graphic code that is doing anything communicative. Um, and there's lots of systems, for example, in the Americas that do that sort of thing. And the advocates for this will say, um, <clears throat> let's have a broader definition. Uh, let's not be, let's not get all hung up. Um, but the, and let's include all these kind of marginalised systems in the, in the club. My problem with that is that it buys into the same social evolutionist narr narrative that I'm trying to escape from. So I'd rather see writing, which is the representation of linguistic structure, as just one thing you can do with graphic codes. It's just there in that kind of family of all these things you can do. It's not the most important, it's not the aim of the game, it's just doing one thing. And what it does, it does very well. So it happens that writing has gone viral. You know, it's really successful, but actually, only in the last 5,000 years have we had writing anywhere and only has it been invented, you know, four times that we're aware of. So it's not, it's rare and it's recent and it does one thing. Message sticks, I want to avoid that kind of characterising message sticks as uh, writing because then it, I'll end up saying that they're trying and failing to do right, right. the photographic thing when they're not trying and failing to do anything. They're doing exactly what they're designed to do. And you, what you do with message sticks, in fact, you can't do with writing in some cases. So I, I love that question and it's something I still want to think about. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a hard one because I want to try and avoid the 
colonial, measuring everything against the colonial metric, but at yeah. the same time, I want to challenge those colonial metrics. So it's a bit of push and pull, I think. Yeah, thanks for that. No Anthony, please. Yeah, uh, I'm just fascinated. You, you said that the message stick is a way of communicating between different languages, which makes sense. I'm just wondering, do you have any idea if the actual messenger would use a different language? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't have any great data on this. This is something I'm going to have to bring back to my field work because the archival data is virtually silent on this question. So only by inference can I guess that that might be the case because, you know, we know that in some cases a message stick is not just travelling over one boundary, but over three or four boundaries right into a different, um, you know, different subgroups as well. So I'm imagining inductively that the message is going to change, um, that, that the language of the message may change or it may stay the same. It may be communicated in that language, in that kind of accommodating multilingualism way. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, this is something that I would like to ask um, my consultants up in, up in Arnhem Land. If I could then, would that uh, influence who can be selected as a messenger? Yeah, I think probably it could. Again, this is all inference as well. So one of the interesting things is, for example, the Jari um, don't use, never use message six apparently, or not in the, um, the period before, around the time of contact. The messengers for those guys were always women, always had to be women. Um, and they didn't use message sticks. And I have a hunch um, that the women were, because of a hunch that we've got some sort of um, patrilocal system of exogamy, that um, the women are going to be kin of the people who are receiving the message. So in that case, they're probably already bringing a language from that location. I don't know, but these are the kinds of things that I, um, I can make inferences about, but um, I can't really always bed them down in, in every case. Um, Brett, please go ahead. Thanks, Piers. Interesting stuff. Um, maybe I missed this, but were you thinking of taking some of these archival message sticks back to the groups that they're supposed to be from and uh, trying to get an interpretation? Uh, no, you didn't miss that. Um, I just didn't talk about it. Um, <laughs> but I did take, there's a bunch of um, message sticks that are in various collections that are were assumed to be from uh, the Tiwi Islands or from, like there's good contextual evidence that they're probably from either the Tiwi Islands or Western Arnhem Land. And when I went up to do pilot research, I brought printouts of those things and asked consultants to comment on them. Um, and we did, you know, a little bit of crossing work. Um, and I, I've still yet to go through all of that. The museums were very happy with that stuff too. Um, so there's that angle. Um, if, if that's what you're talking about, to look at, to see if these ones in archives can be interpreted or glossed by living people. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't go quite as, uh, it wasn't as productive as I hoped. Um, that everyone was very happy to see these pictures and said, can you bring more? These are great. And they're all sitting in that, uh, some of them hanging up in the art centres now. But what was more interesting was, I guess, the consultants making the message sticks physically on the spot and talking about them there. Um, yeah, but that's another thing. And repatriation is not something also that's on the agenda, just because I'm not an expert. I think Jason Wilson is here. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> lob in and do something like this badly. There are one or two objects that I flagged as probably stolen. Um, and um, so this is something that might be a, a cause for repatriation at some point, which would be really good. Because uh, I noticed you had one from Numuwa'a, uh, carved by a, the grandfather of people that I know in Numuwa'a, and I'm sure they'd be really delighted and amazed to see it. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with you about that. Okay. Yeah, Craig. Cool. Um, perhaps on that note, I might use my presenter's priority to just ask Piers, are you aware of, I've come across these things in archives, 
from the 1970s and 80s from Northern Australia, cassette tapes that were sent long distances. Uh -huh. Kind of playing possibly a sort of similar. <laughs> a sim so you get them between Wadia and Darwin and they've got messages on them often about, uh, I think often they mention like sickness or death or I think called to ceremony as well. Yeah, that's really cool. I'll, um, I've not heard of that. So I'd happily talk to you more about that. That's cool. Mm. Um, but if there's no further burning questions, then this thanks, let's all thanks Piers again for absolutely fascinating seminar. Never has a decra been more deserved, I'd say. It looks like it's going to be just really, really interesting research project. So congratulations, Piers. Thank you. And let us all now go and enjoy our weekends.